So welcome to Ask the Grant Writing Expert, everybody. It's good to be back after a much needed vacation. Um, I'm Dr. Meg Bouvier. You know me as the creator of your um, library of NIH grantsmanship courses. I have over 35 years of experience as an NIH grantee, intramural researcher, staff writer, and now a full-time um, grant mentor. So I've helped clients land over half a billion dollars in federal funding, and I'm here to answer your questions. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. So a reminder for folks who are attending live, you're in listen-only mode. So um, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. And if you have any information that you want to share about any of the topics that we're discussing, feel free to type information in the chat box. Um, and um, if you're watching this as a recording on our YouTube channel, just a reminder that we're recording this on um, April 19th, 2023, and everything we say today is true to the best of our knowledge on April 19th, but <laughs> things change very quickly at NIH, so you want to make sure that um, everything that um, we're saying is, is still accurate. So what you should be viewing in the library now, uh, if you're targeting a cycle one application, you may wanna be thinking about watching something like Master the R Series Part One Preparation and Part Two uh, Drafting the Specific Games page. Um, if you're a little further along uh, watching the other writing portions of that, parts three and four. Um, and in terms of updates, I would say probably the most significant update that I've heard recently at NIH is that um, not surprisingly, and as predicted, they are ending their pandemic-related um, change to the post-submission material policy, um, whereby they allowed preliminary data to go in as post-submission material. Happily, in its place, they are making as a permanent policy that you can add preliminary data as post-submission material for just for R01, R21, and R03 applications for mechanisms that allow it. So for example, the parent mechanisms do allow uh, post-submission material. So to me, this is a very happy, uh, happy bit of news that people can um, add preliminary data as post-submission material. And it always seems to come as welcome news to um, applicants. So, um, I want to pause here and introduce our guest, um, Becky, Dr. Becky Miro. She's been with us before to talk about the update to um, the uh, data management policy. And when it first came out, the, the data management policy, and she's going to give us updates today. So Becky, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about the topic? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I uh, have been a research administrator for majority of my career at universities and nonprofits and um, one cancer hospital. And so I, like Meg mentioned, I did the original presentation on the DMS policy. And since then, it's been about three months since it took effect. And of course, a lot of people had a lot of questions and NIH has been really good about pulling out updates and clarifications and whatnot. And so what I'm going to present today is just those extra bits just to keep everyone informed. Um, so I am going to share my PowerPoint now. So let me know if you can or cannot see it. Can everybody see that? Okay, perfect. Okay, so just a bit of background very briefly because we covered it last time. Um, the DMS policy um, took effect for applications that were submitted on or after January 25th of this year. And the general goals was to make an NIH funded um, scientific study data available more quickly because that can lead to a couple of things. It could lead to the acceleration of biomedical discovery. It's more effective use of NIH resources because they are avoiding funding duplicate studies and duplicate da data collections. Um, and it makes data available more quickly to enable validation of research results and it provides data sets and so forth. Um, and as a reminder, the types of mechanisms that have to include a DMS plan would be anything that generates scientific data. So the R mechanisms, some Ks, SBIRs and STTRs, and research center grants. So the biggest development since January has been clarification on how to address DMS in the budgets. 
So as you all probably know, NIH has modular budgets and detailed budgets. If you're doing a detailed budget, they want the DMS costs, all of DMS costs in one line item, they want it in one of these three boxes, and it has to say data management and sharing costs in the line, and then you put your total next to it. Um, it's, this is in the other direct costs part of the detailed budget. If you're doing a modular budget, there is no detailed budget. Um, so your DMS costs become part of your modular total. So up to $250,000, you include your DMS costs in that. And then in this additional narrative justification attachment, the attachment must be called data management and sharing justification. It's a PDF, as you know, and you attach it here. So the other thing to be aware of is, and I reached out to NIH on this one because it just wasn't super clear in what they had provided. And they confirmed that if the PI or other of your key or other personnel will be doing both non-DMS roles, so for example, the data collections, and then DMS activities, uh, curating the data to put it into a repository. You split that out. So their non-DMS activities, costs, their effort would go in section A if it's the PI or key personnel or section B if it's other personnel who are doing this. And then their effort for the DMS related activities get included in section F which is in this line item. Then the other thing is to know that if you happen to not have any DMS costs, which I've already dealt with one of these, the investigator did not have any DMS costs to include, you still have to include the line item if you're doing a detailed budget, you put zero dollars in there. And in your budget justification that goes along with your detailed budget, you still list the line item and say that there are no DMS costs associated with it. If you're doing the modular budget, you still have to attach your additional budget justification PDF and stay make a statement that no costs related to DMS activities are expected. Um, along that line, um, what I wanted to mention is remember that the system, so, uh, and I, let me hop ahead here real quick. Um, there are system checks. Um, so the NIH system knows which NOAs or, and now they're, they're going to be called NOFOs. So notice a funding opportunity They're They're changing that name. Um, it knows which ones will require DMS plan attachments. But what it can't confirm is, did you write the right thing in your attachment? So it'll look for, in a, in a detailed budget, it'll look for the line item and, and the dollar amount or a zero. It doesn't know which one of the two. Um, but if, and it'll look for your justification in a modular budget, but it can't know what's in the content. So just be sure that you're putting in the right stuff and that you're being clear. Um, going back a slide, other uh, updates is, so if you have DMS costs for a subaward, you have to list it as a single line item if you're doing a detailed budget on the R&R for the subaward. If the subaward is not going to have DMS costs, then you don't have to put the line item in at all. Um, DMS costs line item still has to be included, but just put dollar um, a zero. Um, for other applications, so like a complex grant application where you have an overall budget and you have different cores and whatnot, you include the DMS costs within the applicable component that's going to be handling the data management sharing. And for the multi-project applications, you only include it in the overall component. Um, then this is sort of related. Um, 
I actually had to work on an AHRQ, which as you may know, is they're, they're real similar to NIH in a lot of ways. But when we reached out to AHRQ, they don't want a, they don't want it handled like NIH is handling. They instructed us to include, oops, I'm sorry, that was my bad. Um, include the data management plan in the resource sharing plan attachment. And they provided us a link to this NOT, which documents this. So if you're planning an AHRQ, just know that there is a difference. And this is where, you're, uh, where you should look. And if you're, if you're still in doubt, reach out to your program people and double check it. it that never hurts. Um, also, NIH has been building a repository of uh, DMS samples, and we provided the link in the chat, in the Q&A, um, but here's what it looks like. It, you actually go to the section called Writing a Data Management and Sharing Plan, and here's a link to sample plans, um, and this is basically what it looks like. There are different uh, examples, so this one is clinical and or MRI data from human research participants. Here's one for secondary data analysis. Here's one for genomic data. And I believe even from the last time I had looked, they've added like three more um, from when I took the screenshot yesterday. So that is just some of the new developments. Um, remember that the main website is sharing.nih.gov. And within that, there's an obvious block of what is um, mandatory as of January 25th, and it is just an ever-growing resource of information. Um, so on that note, do we have questions? And uh, just to point out what Becky said before, in the chat, there is a link both to um, her latest blog post um, about the DMSP and um, the link to the sample DMS plans. Yeah. Um, I do see there, I mean, we have a bunch of questions here, but one mm -hmm. of them, I'm gonna start with the last one because that one actually pertains to this. Given the new DMS plan requirement, should a section on reproducibility and transparency still be included in the scientific narrative? This is a great question. Um, so, what I would do um, is include in the approach section of the research narrative a section entitled scientific rigor, um, which is technically what the scoring criteria is. So um, the scoring criterion is. So um, when reviewers are looking at a sheet of paper, it actually the scoring criterion with an approach is scientific rigor. Technically, it's not reproducibility and transparency. So. I would handle the issue of reproducibility and transparency in the uh, DMS plan. In the approach under scientific rigor, you're going to talk about things like, you know, um, running experiments in triplicate, using appropriate controls, blinding investigators, things that add to the rigor of the actual execution of the project. So I think you need to think about those as two separate things now. They used to kind of all be grouped together in scientific rigor, but now I would strip out the kind of those reproducibility and transparency sections and put them in the DMS plan. Um, okay, so any other questions about, we have uh, several other questions and I know we had one emailed as well. Um, oh yeah, and, and the emailed question is now in here. Thank you, Sherry, for putting that there. Um, so, um, if people don't have questions, uh, any further questions about the uh, DMS plan, we'll just go ahead and start answering um, the, the regular questions. Uh, let's see, hold on. I'm just scanning this to see if there are any others related to DMS. <clears throat> okay, so we have about five questions in here right now, so keep putting them in there if you like. Um, and we'll just start working our way through. And um, Becky, feel free to jump in on any of these. Um, is it ever possible to receive a good environment score from an R2 institution that has little history with R01 level NIH grants? Um, this is a really good question. So um, I would say that um, you're, it is a bit of an uphill battle, but the, the trick here would be to convince reviewers that whatever you're proposing, you have the necessary environment to do it. Um, you do risk the 
what reviewers are not supposed to do, which is rush to judgment, you know, make a snap decision just based on the name of the organization. Um, <clears throat> but what you want to do is really um, put a lot of effort into convincing reviewers that um, the, the facilities um, that you need, the infrastructure that you need actually does exist at your organization. And of course, if you're in the R15 mechanism, um, it's a much easier thing. So if you really do have um, something that's a lot, like a lot smaller and is R15 eligible, that's not going to be an issue. Um, but that's what I would do is really um, write a longer section on facilities and environment to uh, make sure that they understand that you have the whatever you need. Um, Becky, any other thoughts on that? No, I mean, just sell the positive that you have what you need. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, what can you do if you have one very positive review, one review with a legitimate critique, and one review in which the actual reviewer is criticizing you as a new investigator status and saying that you are a bad investigator because this would be your first R01? Um, the, this reviewer does not know that I had 11 years as a lecturer with overload teaching or a joint appointment with a 75% teaching load with 30 advisees. And then I am just coming off of a K01 brand. Can I address this in the letter back if I choose to resubmit? It seemed a bit cruel um, not to uh, to not know my past teaching load and then give me a bad score for never having an R01 in the past. My record is great given that my teaching load is, um, has been, I wrote and got an R a K01 funded off of a lecturer job. Most people cannot do that indeed. Um, how do I address this? So I actually have an applicant and this is not, the person who asked the question, it's a different applicant at a different organization who's um, fighting a very similar battle right now. And I can tell you uh, on, a, on a cycle two submission, and I can tell you what her program officer told her when they were reviewing the summary statements, which is to hammer away, not just in the introduction to the revised application, but throughout the narrative itself, the 12 page narrative um, about what your background is. And um, the fact that you have had a non-traditional path, you don't want to do it in such a way that you sound like it's you're over explaining, but you want to make absolutely clear, not just in the introduction to the revised application, not just in the personal statement of the biosketch, but at your main areas within the uh, approach section as well that reviewers are really crystal clear that you are somebody who's coming out of um, a situation that has had a very heavy teaching orientation and um, sell it as a positive that you landed that KO one as a lecturer and that um, you are um, coming out of this non-traditional path and now applying for an R01 so that uh, you know, we all like to think that uh, reviewers read applications very carefully from start to finish and then walk into the study section meeting, remembering every detail of every application of the 10 or 12 applications that they read ahead of the meeting. And um, they're human and that just doesn't happen. So if you want them to uh, remember something that crucial, you just gotta hammer away at it in multiple places in the, in the application package. So uh, that was the advice that a program officer recently um, gave to um, a client of mine who is getting ready for a cycle two application. All right, let's see. Also, my K01 was not a clinical trial years ago, but because we had an experimental manipulation, it would be considered a clinical trial today. If I write an R01 grant to do secondary data analysis on the K01 data, would it be considered a clinical trial now or not? Um, typically, secondary data analysis is not a clinical trial because you're not doing the manipulation in, in that, in the secondary data analysis. However, it might be a human subjects project. And that may be actually what you're meaning to ask. Um, and that is gonna hinge on um, whether or not, typically it will hinge on whether or not any, whether or not the people are still alive and whether or not anybody on your team can um, re-identify the data points and connect them to an actual human. Um, I've shared many times on this um, uh, forum the, the flow chart for deciding whether something is a human subjects project or not. Um, so Julie, if that is not something um, you're familiar with, just shoot me an email and I'll send you the link for that. 
Uh, but it's not a clinical trial for sure, because as a secondary data analysis, you're not the one doing the manipulation at that point. So it's definitely not a trial. Um, okay, the next question, and this was emailed ahead of time, but repeated here, can you differentiate between background and the significant section and background and the approach section? Um, so background information in the traditional sense that we think of it, um, like you would include in a journal article, can go in a, a variety of places in your 12-page uh, research strategy. So you've named the two typical places, which would be in um, the approach section, and there are two different places within the approach where it can go, um, and the significant section. So um, because you're talking about the rigor of the prior research and significance, sometimes you're um, also providing preliminary data there and background information there. And I've noticed a tendency in recent years for the size of the significant section to burgeon. So um, anybody on this call who's been around for a number of years probably remembers way back in like 2008 and nine when we moved to the 12 page format, seeing really short significant sections that were very punchy and salesy um, and combined with innovation might've been a single page. That has just migrated to the other extreme where now we're seeing significant sections that are sometimes four pages or more um, and may contain some preliminary data and may contain some background information versus putting those things in approach. So the background information alternatively or in addition to putting it in the significance, you could have a general background information at the beginning of the approach as it applies to the whole project and or you could have some background information at the beginning of each aim as it applies to a given aim, or some combination of those three locations. Um, I don't have a strong opinion about which is better. Um, I've seen successful applicants use all three, um, or just one, or some combination of two. It really depends on what feels intuitive to you in terms of how to tell the story. So um, think from the point of view of a reviewer who's reading the application, and this is where having an outside reader can be really helpful. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it makes more sense to include a lot of background in the significance, and sometimes it makes more sense to save it for the approach or some combination. So, um, so that's my take on that. You could go in one of those three places or some combination of them, and there's no right or wrong there. Um, and successful applicants have done both. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, and I think does the does the latest DMS link work there? I'm seeing that somebody had a, a question about whether that was working. Hopefully that last one is working. Um, okay, in your K training, you discuss the issue of stacking aims. You mentioned that sometimes it is okay if aims are contingent on one another. Sometimes it is more risky and worries reviewers is the best way to explore whether it is too risky to re, uh, to review it with a program officer, or do you have any other advice on this context? I'm proposing to implement an adapted psychological intervention, and then she lists the aims. Uh, so aim three is contingent on aim two. So um, this question of contingency of the aims, so the, the, the risk there for reviewers is that they worry that if an early aim fails, the whole project's gonna go down like dominoes and you're not gonna be able to do anything else. Um, so whenever possible, you wanna design a project where the aims are related but able to stand alone. But we all know that that's not always feasible, that sometimes you legitimately need the data from aim two to move on to aim three. When that is the case, your task as a, a savvy grant writer is to convince reviewers that the probability of success on aim two is extremely high. So um, you do that by presenting lots of preliminary data, showing that the team who will be conducting that aim has lots of expertise in the thing that they're proposing to do. You have to kind of go out of your way to convince them that, um, that what you're proposing, even though it is contingent, is very low risk. So that's my opinion on that. Um, we are getting a request to share Becky's slides. I'm not quite sure how we do that, but we will powwow on our end 
and figure out how to do that. I know that the information um, is in the blog post that she uh, wrote. That That's correct, right, Becky? Yeah, that's right. So um, if you go to the uh, chat box, there is a, a link to the blog post and to NIH's um, sample plans. So the information in the slide <laughs> is in that blog post. Now, to be clear, the, the screenshots um, detailing the, the, the two budget scenarios is not in the blog, but I can work with your the, the web person to see if we can get it up there in, in a pretty format. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Yep. yep. Okay, uh, we have a bunch more questions, so I'm going to whiz through as many as I can in the last five minutes. The NIH has an RFA that is only one time. Uh, well, that's redundant. RFAs are one time. So the, uh, uh, RFA is a, is a set aside. It's a finite pot of money, and the, when the money runs out, you're done. They don't typically get renewed. They don't they don't typically allow resubmissions, and they're not a line item in the budget the way like the parent R01 announcement is. So RFAs are typically one time. Um, it is a center grant. Based on the RFA, it seems like they are targeting a specific research group. Is it worth trying? Um, I center grants are an enormous amount of time and effort. Um, and um, the only ones they fund are the ones that very specifically speak to their highest areas of highest priority. If you have a suspicion that the, the money is earmarked for another group, that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. And in fact, the largest grant win I ever had, which was a $100 million HRSA grant, was earmarked for a group in Connecticut. And for whatever reason, my client in Ohio landed it at the last minute. And I never know what kind of backroom handshake deals went on there. But, you know, if we hadn't thrown our hat in the ring, we, we wouldn't have landed that money. So, um, you know, I, it's, it's always worth doing because it's, you can always repackage it and, and sell it to somebody else. But um, I would, as always, get on the phone with the program officer and suss out as much information as you can. And if you have any kind of a um, policy group at your university, um, see if they can dig up any uh, scuttlebutt about who it might be earmarked for. Um, and and just try to to figure it out. But I, you know, like I gather whatever you can information you can. And if you do have a sense that it might be earmarked for somebody else, think about your competitive advantage compared to that group. What do you have to offer that that group is can't offer? Um, what would be the advantage of them funding you over that group that you suspect it's earmarked for? So, uh, okay, I just want to make sure I have a transparency and reproducibility and a scientific rigor section. Is that recommended to have both? Um, so, uh, Mohammed, we were talking about this a little earlier where, um, I mean, people have all different types of headers or multiple headers for scientific rigor. It could be um, enhancing reproducibility, it could be scientific rigor, it could be um, rigor and transparency, it could be transparency and reproducibility. Any combination of those are fine. However, now that there's a new um, DMS plan, you might want to strip out some of the language having to do with reproducibility and transparency and move it to the DMS plan, which is a welcome um, break of, you know, being able to move text out of that tight 12-page narrative and into another document and it frees you up to discuss other things. Um, but what you definitely want to have in the approach, whatever you call it, is some variation on scientific rigor where you talk about things like running controls and running things in triplicate and blinded investigators and that kind of thing. Also, the expected results, do we have to list all the results we are going to expect or just the top highlights? Top highlights is fine. Nobody's going to hold you to, things never go exactly the way you plan. So just kind of hit on the highlights and importantly, what that information uh, will tell you and do to advance the project in the field. Lastly, what do you think about repetitions in the grant? Is this a good thing? I heard different option, uh, different opinions. <clears throat> so um, repetition in the grant can be a very good thing if done judiciously, because you're almost always going to be over the page limit, especially if your clinical trialists can move some information to the human subject section. 
but non-human subjects folks, you're going to be scraping up against the page limit. So if you're going to repeat something, it damn well better be important. Um, so you can repeat things like your competitive advantage and your impact and things like that, where it's you're trying to beat the reviewers over the head with a hammer so that they don't miss it. Um, but sometimes instead of repeating it, what you want to do is judiciously format it to make sure that they don't miss it. Um, so that could be anything from making it bold or underlined to putting it in a text box. I've done this on grant applications too, you know, as if you're reading like a magazine article, you know, there's nothing that says that you can't put a text box around some key piece of information um, as long as you're not dropping the font size and trying to circumvent the page limits and then like lightly shade the background. And now that's the feature of the page and they can't miss the statement. So that might be the formatting approach might be a better way to beat them over the head rather than repeating again and again. But of course, you're going to have some repetition between the aims page and the um, and the research strategy. There's no way around that. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, I would like to see the flow chart for clinical trial or not to. Um, OK, so I'm going to just dig that up quickly. We're a few minutes over. Um, Thank you. The blog post link is not working as of it's, it. I tried it. It's working for me. I would recommend maybe trying a different browser for that, Sherry, just in case it's a browser thing. Um, OK, and I'm going to quickly drop that. This isn't a question of, uh, hold on. I'm going to drop something in there, too. Okay, so I just put a link in there that will take you to, uh, hold on a second, this page, definition of a human subjects uh, project. And specifically what I was referring to is this last one. I, I use this a lot too, the exemption one, but by far, this is the one I use the most, the fourth infographic, which will take you here. And this is um, pertaining to the person who said she didn't know if her secondary data analysis would be a clinical trial. Um, I think what she's asking is, it is, is it a human subjects project? Because it's definitely not a clinical trial. And um, this flow chart helps you figure that out. So again, I put the link to this page and it's the, the bottom infographic. So hopefully people can see that. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything. I think we've, I've, by some miracle, I'm only two minutes over and I've answered all the questions. So I thank everybody for attending. It looks like next time is going to be May 3rd and we're going to have as our guest, I'm very excited, um, Dr. David Widmer is going to be speaking to us about um, an essential part of a grant PI's role, speaking to the program officer, and he'll also be asking questions. David has um, several decades of experience in a very high profile RD office um, and is a dear friend. And I'm very excited to have him on uh, AGE for the first time. So um, thank you all for attending. And um, I wish you the best of luck on your NIH um, grant writing. And we'll see you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.